Well, happy new year and happy 2018 uh, officially. And for the first time for me to be able to say that to you, feels like New Year's was so long ago, but it was only uh, a week ago. Um, we are um, starting a uh, new series this week that I will be giving you a little bit of background about today in this uh, first message in this series. Uh, and before we get to that background, a little bit of uh, other introduction. Um, this is, as you all know, that time of the year when we are kind of taught culturally that it would be a good thing to sort of uh, press pause on the daily grind of concentrating on just the urgent and that culturally we tend to find ourselves at least feeling the inkling to look a little bit more at the big picture and to instead of be focusing just on the urgent to think about what is the most important and so there's these things called new year's resolutions that happen and we set goals for ourselves and we we look at what do we want uh, for our lives and for our family in this next year and whether it's in the area of personal finances or physical health or relationships there's these big picture questions and big picture view that we tend to have during this time of the year. And, and I, I want to say a couple things about that. First of all, there's a part of that that's really good. I mean, if we are only every day going through life thinking about what is urgent or what's on the calendar for that day, but not thinking, not having ever time to think about the big picture, we're probably missing something and likely not as centered as what we should be. But with that said, I also kind of want to alert you to the other side of this discussion when it comes to this time of year and thinking about my life in the big picture and what I want to pursue. And with that in mind, I came across a quote from an early 1800s philosopher named Soren Kierkegaard. Now, as you go home today and Google him, I am going to give you a disclaimer that I probably don't agree with with well over half to 75% of what he's written, and especially things about God, he and I would, <laughs> would differ on, okay? But there was this sentence, there was this statement that I read that was so compelling and thought-provoking for me in the beginning of this year on the other side of New Year's resolutions that I just, I needed to share it with you, and I felt like it's just such a great lead into our series. This is what Soren Kierkegaard said in the early 1800s, and you'll think he lived in 2017 as I read it. Most men, most people pursue pleasure, go after pleasure with such breathless haste that they hurry past it. Let me fill in some gaps if you're trying to zero in on what this means. What Soren Kierkegaard is saying is that people in general tend to be so geared on working hard, hard, hard to find pleasure, to find happiness, to find significance, that in their pursuit of what they want, they hurry past some of the things that actually they already have. And they miss the blessings, the significance, the happiness and pleasure that is already in their life. Would you agree with Soren? I do. Like I said, this was written in the early 1800s. I'm like, man, is he a prophet? And then I read the rest of his work and like, he's not a prophet, but, <laughs> but this is true. This is really true. And all of this dovetails into this series that we've chosen for the beginning of this year. And there's a couple different reasons why we chose this series for this time. This, first of all, is not a self-help series. This is not a five steps to a better you series. This is not how do I pursue happiness and pleasure and, and significance with great haste. This is a don't miss the significance and pleasure and happiness that you already have in the pursuit of that which you think is better. And so we're going to spend 14 weeks looking at the three-year ministry of Jesus. This is the longest series we've ever had at Bethlehem. And if 
This is what I felt. Like if ever there was the longest series, like a good title for it would be Jesus if you're a Christian church, right? So this is the longest series that we've ever had and it's strategically placed between Christmas and Easter because we just had celebration of Jesus' birth and the series is going to end the celebration of Jesus' death and resurrection on Easter, which is April 1st this year. Jesus is the answer to pretty much everything in our lives. Jesus doesn't promise to take away all of our earthly problems, but he is the answer with how we address them. He's the answer to hope and joy and peace. And so I don't know if we're going to come back to this every single week, but as I think about what I hope to accomplish over the next 14 sermons, okay, this is kind of what it is, that I would love for you and every attender to realize that Jesus' story, what he did, has the power to change you and to change your story. And for some of you, you've already experienced that and and, and maybe it's just needing to fine-tune it a little bit because we forget. For others of you, you're wondering, how does that work and what did he do to change my story? And this is going to be the perfect series for you. Now, we're going to start at the beginning of Jesus' ministry this week. Guess how old Jesus was at the beginning of his ministry? Some of you know. He was 30 years old. All right? So, As I kind of give you an intro and bring you up to speed, the question that I knew some of you would have, especially if you're brand new to the Gospels, and I just want to address it, is what about the first 30 years of Jesus' life? We honestly don't know a whole lot about the first 30 years of Jesus' life. Here's, Here's what we know. We know that Jesus was born in Bethlehem. By the way, it wasn't on December 25th, and that's an entirely different discussion for a different time, but probably in the spring of the year. But anyway, he was born in Bethlehem. We know that when he was a a little child, that his parents took Jesus and fled to Egypt because there was a crazy king in Israel named Herod that was killing babies, okay? Um, We know that eventually after Egypt, Joseph, Mary, and Jesus ended up settling in Mary and Joseph's hometown in northern Israel called Nazareth. Um, We know that um, when Jesus was 12, his family took a trip to Jerusalem uh, to celebrate the Passover. And while they were there, uh, they kind of lost track of Jesus only to find him in probably the first place that I would have looked, I don't know, at the temple. And he was uh, asking questions and listening to the the teachers there. Um, We know that Joseph was a carpenter. And so it's pretty good speculation to think that Jesus was trained also to be a carpenter. Uh, We have it on pretty good authority that Mary and Joseph were a God-fearing family, uh, that they did not have much. They were a poor family. We know that Jesus had other brothers and sisters that were kind of like him, but really not like him at all, okay? (laughs) But beyond that, we don't know a whole lot. And I, I think it's somewhat humorous when you watch Hollywood movies about Jesus because they feel compelled to sort of fill in some blanks and they start to put out certain things that you just have to know. And we have no idea whether these things happened or not uh, uh, and, and likely not. Things like uh, when Jesus was an adolescent, instead of having to actually do his chores, he just snapped his fingers and his room got clean because he was the Son of God, right? Things like getting a 36 on his ACT and he was a leading rusher on his football team. I didn't see that in movies by any means, but people speculate that Jesus just must have been good at everything because he was the Son of God. Or that when he was a 20-something apprentice of his father Joseph as a carpenter, that he made the best tables and the best chairs the world had ever seen. Why? Well, because he was the son of God. Now, the reality of the matter is, 
is that likely none of those things that I just said, especially Jesus taking his ACTs, is true, okay? You know what the truth is? The truth is that Jesus, that the entire world knows about today and has for centuries, grew up in relative anonymity. That there was a very few small handful of people that knew what was destined for this man with the very common name at the time, Joshua or Jesus, and that the rest of the world just thought he was a guy who happened to be a really good kid. <laughs> Sidebar for a second. You know how like sometimes your first child and second child are nothing alike? Like the first one is a rule follower and the second one is not and you know different things and, and you're like surprised? Like I thought that all kids were this way or all kids were that way. Like just think about Mary and Joseph. They, they raised a perfect kid and like this parenting thing. Man, why is our neighbors thinking this is so hard? And then, and then they had Jesus' brother or sister and they found out what a sinful child is like. But that was the only way that Jesus from what the world could see, really seemed that different. He was just, he was a good kid. And all of that dovetails into part of why Jesus' ministry kicked off with the event that we're going to be looking at today. Because there's something that happened that day, actually two things, that I really want to hone in on, on the minutes that we have here to look at it. So let's start with Matthew chapter. Um, oh, so one of the things that happened is to show how Jesus grew up in anonymity is even when he came to his hometown to preach and to teach, after he was done and he preached so eloquently, the people there asked the question, isn't this the carpenter's son? Isn't this, uh, isn't his mother's name Mary? Aren't his brothers James, Joseph, Simon, and Judas? Aren't all his sisters with us? This is that scriptural backing for what I was sharing about Jesus' relative anonymity. Matthew chapter 3. Then Jesus came, he's about 30 years old, from Galilee in the north, the northern area of Israel, to the Jordan River, which is kind of right in the middle of Israel, to be baptized by John. And we got to camp out on John for a moment. So this is the same John that if you were here at Bethlehem in December, he's the same John that was promised to be born of Elizabeth and Zechariah, even though they were long past childbearing years. This is the, the same um, John whose mother Elizabeth was a relative or a cousin of Jesus' mother Mary. They, John and Jesus had a connection. This is the same John that when Mary, the mother of Jesus, came to tell Elizabeth, John's mother, that she was pregnant with the Savior, John, this John, it says, jumped in Elizabeth's womb at the announcement of Mary, the mother of Jesus, and Jesus being in the room, okay? This is that John. And this John was destined to play a huge part in the work of salvation, an important part in the ministry of Jesus. He was promised in the Old Testament that there would be a guy who would come to prepare the way for Jesus' ministry and work. And that's what John had been doing at this point. For how long, we're not exactly sure. But he had been traveling around the area in Middle Israel and he was sharing a message of repentance was the word. A message of repentance, which essentially means that John's message was countercultural to what the people of the time were hearing from their teachers and from their preachers. Because what the church had sort of culminated to at the time was a rule following, get right with God by doing the right thing. And shame on you if you don't do the right thing because God is not going to like you or love you. And John comes and says, you know what? That is not right at all. That you don't have a relationship with God because of your sin, but you're not going to get it by trying to be good. But instead, an acknowledgement of our sinfulness and our inability to be perfect, and then a turning to Jesus in faith, a trusting in him, 
in that coming Savior at that time, in that coming Savior to, to forgive and pay for our sins, that is how we get a relationship with God. Not what we do, but what the coming Savior would do. And then God sort of commissioned John to baptize people, and it says, for the forgiveness of sins. And that's why this John is known as John the Baptist, or John literally the washing man, or John the baptizer, because he was the first person commissioned by God to begin to baptize people for the forgiveness of sins. And so there's this day when Jesus is about 30, and John's by the Jordan River, and he's sharing the message of repentance, and he's baptizing people who need the forgiveness of sins. And all of a sudden, in the line, and we don't know whether John recognized him right away or not, but all of a sudden, there's Jesus. There's the Lamb of God. There's the Son of God, the Savior. And I doubt that anyone else around recognized him because of that anonymity. But even though John wouldn't have recognized or known as much as we know about what Jesus would come to do, he knew that Jesus was special. He knew that Jesus was of God. And so when Jesus asked to be baptized, like if Jesus asked you to baptize him, what would you say? Like, I don't think this is a good idea. Like, Jesus, I think you need to baptize me, right? Well, here's what John says, the exact same thing. John tried to deter him, saying, I need to be baptized by you, and you come to me. Like, if you were in John's sandals and camel's hair, right, wouldn't you feel the same? Inadequate to baptize Jesus. And, oh, by the way, why did he need the forgiveness of sins anyway? We'll come back to that. Here was Jesus' response. Jesus replied, let it be so now. And, and I did a word study in the Greek on that bolded or that yellow part. It's one word that's translated for us, let it be so now. This, this Greek word is the strongest command tense that there is in the Greek. It's like Jesus with five exclamation points behind it, not in a crabby way, but just in a firm way. Like, John, get going. Do it. You're going to baptize me. We're not going to talk about, about it. We're not going to argue about it. You're going to do it. Let it be so now. It is proper for us to do this, to fulfill all righteousness. Then, after Jesus used the aorist imperative, John consented. I am not going to argue with Jesus. And he did that which was very uncomfortable for him, no doubt. Baptized Jesus. Now, we're going to come back to, in a moment, the significance of that. We're going to end with that. But for now, I'd like to continue with the next verses and then come back to 14, 15. So let's go to 16. As soon as Jesus was baptized, he went up out of the water. And at that moment, heaven was opened and he saw the Spirit of God descending like a dove and alighting, or lighting him up, alighting on him. Verse 17. And a voice from heaven said, This is my Son, whom I love. With him I am well pleased. Now, I don't know what happened at your baptism. But nothing like this happened at mine. And here's why I mention that. Because when this happens at someone's baptism— you begin to wonder about that person. Like, that must be a special person. Like, there must be something different about that guy. And that was exactly the point. That's exactly what needed to happen at the beginning of Jesus' ministry. Jesus comes to be baptized. We'll talk about why in a second. But as he's being baptized, the heaven, and Mark, the, another of the gospel writers, uses the, the word translated in English that the sky tore. So this isn't like the, the clouds kind of moved to the side and the sun shone on Jesus. No, there was something, a miracle going on. The sky tore. I don't even know what that was like, but it's something I have not seen before, and you either. The Holy Spirit was there coming down on Jesus and lighting him up. And then there was like the heavenly polk sound bar in the sky. And Jesus, annou or God announcing, this is my son whom I love. I am well pleased with him. And you know what that meant? That meant there was something special about Jesus. And the fact that the father would be well pleased with him, this is all you need to know about the first 30 years. Jesus never messed up. 
Jesus never forgot, oh yeah, I shouldn't act that way because I'm here to save people. That in every moment of his upbringing and of his 30 years, he knew he was here for a purpose. And he carried out the perfect life for 30 years to this point that you and I are impossible to carry out. This is my son whom I love. With him, I am well pleased. And remember, I'm not just introducing a sermon. I'm introducing an entire series. And you need to know this and you need to come back to this, that God was pleased with Jesus as he began his three-year ministry. And so our second fill-in for today. Jesus' baptism was the right start to his three-year ministry because God made it clear that Jesus was the right one or the right guy, the right person. Jesus' baptism was the perfect start because of the announcement that God made clear to the people around that this was the right guy. Now, the truth of the matter is, is as we read through the rest of Jesus' ministry, that the people, even the people who were there, which probably numbered in the hundreds, they either didn't get it or forgot about it or whatever, and so there was a constant confusion about who Jesus is and why, and what does it mean that he is Savior? And, and so I'm not saying that the people that were there just understood everything. What I am saying is that there's this very public announcement that Jesus is special. And you and I know that Jesus was the Son of God and our Savior. So, I had mentioned we were going to come back to John's question because that's the other part of this section I think is really important as sort of a table setter for the rest of the, the series. Um, actually, the, the exchange between John and Jesus is, is so instructive to understanding the, the rest of Jesus' ministry um, and, and why he was here. And just as a reminder, here is the, the question that John had. I need to be baptized by you, Jesus, and do you come to me? Now, if I can put it in sort of more, um, I guess, picturesque terms, essentially what John is saying as Jesus is in the water and John is there in the position of the baptizer is, Jesus, this would make more sense if we switch spots. Jesus, this doesn't make any sense that I would put the water on you. I think you need to stand where I am and I'm going to stand where you are and we need to just switch. I need to stand in your place and be baptized. You need to stand in my place and be the baptizer. And Jesus replies, verse 15, No, you baptize me now. It is proper for us to do this. It's proper for me to be baptized so as to fulfill all righteousness. And I, I want to camp out on fulfill all righteousness because you need to understand that we cannot skip right ahead to Jesus' death and resurrection and think, oh, we have the Savior that we need. <laughs> that the rest of Jesus' 33 years are just as important, dare I say, or that the death and resurrection would not mean anything if it wasn't for the first 33 years. And here's what I mean. Um, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to use the term, a term, that maybe you've never heard before, but it's worthy of writing down if you can spell it. Substitutionary atonement. This is what God is clear about when it comes to how people are saved that there needs to be a substitutionary atonement, a substitute who atones or makes up for our sin. You see, we would like God to act the way that I sometimes act or you do with your kids. You know they messed up, but it's late and you're tired and you just forget about it. Let's start tomorrow. God being holy and perfect could not do that as much as we'd like him to do that. The fact that you're forgiven is not that God just kind of turned his back and pretended like we had nothing wrong in our life. In fact, that's kind of like saying, okay, the furnace is broken and doesn't work, but I'm just going to pretend like it does. You get cold after a while, right? That doesn't work. 
You can pretend all you want. It's got to be fixed. The relationship between us and God had to be fixed because something was broken. And when we think about that substitution that Jesus had in our place, most of the time, and probably for good reason, but most of the time, we think primarily about the cross, right? And we think about how Jesus, who had no sin, became sin for us, and that we carried that sin to the cross. And then when we look at the cross, we should think about this, that I should have been there. I should have suffered hell, not Jesus in my place. But Jesus on the cross suffered what I deserved. And, and, and that can and should always be sort of the centerpiece of substitutionary atonement. But do you realize that Jesus was doing this all of his life? For 33 years, he was camped out on substitutionary atonement. <laughs> and I don't think he would have used those words. But he recognized that. And how did that work? You see, we just didn't need someone to die for us. We needed someone perfect to die for us, right? And so Jesus was acting as our substitutionary atonement when, and I don't know that this happened, but it probably did. When someone, when he was a kid, was really mean to 10-year-old Jesus, and instead of holding a grudge, Jesus forgave him right away because he was being the substitute for the times when people hurt us and we don't forgive them. <laughs> or the, the time when Jesus reacted with a kind word when his dad came home in a mood had a long day and Jesus reacted with kindness and love and he was being the substitutionary atonement for the times where we act nothing like that when someone's in a mood <laughs> at our home. Or we think about maybe how Jesus, even though scripture records that he had almost nothing, <laughs> sometimes not even a place to sleep, lived each day in thankfulness and contentment even, in a substitutionary atonement way because so many days and so many months of our life are spent in discontentment and lack of thankfulness. And the examples can go on and on and on. But my point is that Jesus needed to be our substitute in every way, even before the cross, and so, I thought we were talking about baptism. <laughs> when John, Jesus asked John to baptize him, and Jesus says, do it now. I'm going to do it to fulfill all righteousness. Jesus is in essence saying, John, I get it. It doesn't make sense. But the reason I came is to stand where you should stand so that someday you can stand where I should stand. The reason I came was to switch places with you. And that, in essence, is why Jesus started, I believe, with baptism to his ministry because it was the announcement that Jesus was the right guy and our next fill-in. Jesus, through it, made it clear that he was here about the right work. And that work was being everything we cannot be. Being the perfect substitute. So that when we celebrate Jesus dying and rising again, it wasn't just a guy. It was the Son of God who lived the perfect life in my place. Now, when I was writing my message this week, there was a point where I'm like, this is going to be like a 60-minute sermon. And that's not good, especially for our Fusion staff. So um, there's a lot more that can be said. I need to jump ahead to the application. And so here's the application to this. 
We started today talking about how when the new year begins, that there's something in us, and some of this can be good, there's something in us that is all gung-ho to pursue pleasure and to pursue better and to pursue happy and to pursue um, satisfaction. And again, I'm going to reiterate, there's nothing all bad about that. Um, it's good to have goals. Actually, God speaks against laziness. It's good to, to use our lives. But I think we also, to be fair, need to acknowledge that at times there's something in that pursuit, like Soren Kierkegaard, you know, sort of shared with us, that isn't admirable, that isn't good, that, dare I say, is probably sinful, right? So often our pursuit is a, based on our need to find acceptance. Our pursuit of finding acceptance from the people around us. And, and it starts as a kid, you want acceptance from your dad who sees you do a handstand in the pool and you keep doing it until dad says, yeah, good job. You didn't really stay up very long. You know, you don't say that, but you know, good job, good job, Tommy. You know, whatever. And it continues with wanting to find acceptance from um, our teacher and from our coach. And then as we get older, from our spouse and from our boss. And then we get older. And if our parents are still alive and there's still something between us, we want acceptance from our parents again, you know. And it, it just, we're looking so often in our pursuits for acceptance. And let me just say, that is a journey with lots of roadblocks and a whole lot of dissatisfaction. What I'm saying is you'll never find contentment looking for acceptance from other people. Because even if you do everything it takes to try to win the affection of that pretty girl, her heart and mind is on someone else. It doesn't matter what you do, right? Or you did all you could do to be a blessing to the project at work and your boss when it was done and you were waiting for the, <clears throat> and maybe the raise, didn't even realize you were on the project. And so often we can pursue people's acceptance all we want, but the roadblock is they don't realize it or they don't care. And even sometimes when we get someone's acceptance, how long will it last? Like till the next time something big comes up at home. Um, have any of you heard of Jack Del Rio? He was a former Viking and coach of the Raiders. He received a four-year contract extension. Do you know when? Actually, I think it was June, but within 2017, yeah. Do you know what happened last week? He got fired. Six months or nine months later. You see what I'm saying? That is this world. That is, what, that is what happens and will happen. We cannot find ultimate acceptance in the people around us or in the work that we do. But at Jesus' baptism, you know what you get? You get the words that were shared with Jesus. This is my son whom I love. With him I am well pleased. By faith in him, you get to be the recipient of those words too. That when the father looks at you through the work of his son, he says, I accept you. I don't love your sin, but I accept you because I see Jesus' holiness, Jesus' perfection, Jesus' substitutionary atonement when I see you. Here's the thing, guys. You have nothing to prove to anyone. And don't live your life that way. But instead, work hard, play hard, have goals, but do it all in the understanding that your identity, your significance has already been won. Here's how I say it in our last fill-in. Don't fight for your approval. Jesus already did it. He already fought for it. And now you are accepted by the one with which it matters the most. And that will be a significance, my friends, that lasts into eternity. Next week, we are going to continue with the first miracle that Jesus did at a wedding in Cana. Let's pray. Dear Heavenly Father, thank you 
for sending your son to be the perfect substitute for me, for us. There are so many times where even when I know what I need to do or what I should not do, yet I do that which I didn't want to do. Please forgive me. And today, help me rejoice in the fact that I have a Savior that not only died for me, but was perfect all the way through his life to be the perfect substitute that I needed. I pray this all in Jesus' name. Amen.